So exactly how far is the Andromeda Galaxy, M31? You have to use R.R. Lyrae's and Cepheids to get you there. So let's see how that was done historically. And the details are coming in because off to the left on this thing with this picture from, from CTIO, we see the large and small Magellanic clouds in the center of the Milky Way to the right, but the LMC is on the bottom and the SMC is on the top. And those clouds are actually galaxies and they're orbiting the Milky Way and that's what we know now, but we didn't know their distances. And what were those objects? And that was the study of the subject that we're about to talk about. So let's take it back in time. The concept of distance and how big the universe is took a big step forward in 1610. So after thousands of years of looking at the stars and simply knowing that they're far, but thinking they were pasted on a celestial sphere, the Starry Messenger was published by Galileo Galilei in 1610. And what he showed was that the galaxy itself is a lot of stars. So he took his tiny telescope and looked at the Milky Way and these drawings that he did of the stars showed many faint stars that he couldn't see by eye. And so if we look at the Milky Way on an extraordinarily dark night where there's no light pollution, which they didn't have in 1610, I mean, it was actually dark sky, unlike today where you can barely count 50 stars. Back in 1610, a night sky in the city was actually dark. And so you could see many, many, many stars. But through the telescope, you could see more. So therefore, he knew that the galaxy, meaning the Milky Way, was just many, many stars that were faint, that just blended together, that could be resolved with a telescope. And that was the first inkling that the Milky Way was much, much, much bigger. In 1750, a theologian named Thomas Wright created a model of the Milky Way based on theological ideas, and his goal was really a wacky concept, but his goals, basically he said, well, the sun is in some grand shell around the center of everything. And so if we looked along the edges of the shell, we'd see more stars, which is similar to what we see in the sky. We see a shell or a ring in the sky. So if we were in the middle of that ring, we would see stars in that ring around us and it would taper off. But looking above and below that shell, we would see fewer stars. And so his model has, you know, kind of explains the appearance of the sky, but you know, this was his real model. So he was looking at the concept of the theology behind the starry work, and we were in one of many stars inside this grand shell. His conceptualization was that somewhere in the center of some grand shell, which we could not perceive, was God. And God looked out at the rest of the stars around him in the firmament, and all of those stars held innumerable planets, and you can kind of see it alluding to it in this thing. And so his, his concept was theological, and if you go hunt around at Thomas Wright's work, you find some really trippy stuff. And it's always got these little stars with eyes in the center. It's very Illuminati. But anyway, that was 1750. Well, people like William and Caroline Herschel in 1785, they were a brother and sister pair, and William and Caroline Herschel were arguably one of the most important astronomers in history. They, counted, they decided, after building a four-foot diameter telescope together, uh, where William ground the mirror while Caroline fed him bananas over the course of many days and kept him going so that he could keep his arms moving so that the glass could take the shape that they wanted. But what they did is eventually, after many, many years of, build, of trying to build this telescope, eventually they had constructed the whole thing and started looking out into the sky and looked in many, many directions, about 690 directions, 683 directions, with their big scope. And they assumed that all stars had the same brightness. And if you really don't know the anything better, you might as well assume that. And so therefore, if stars are at certain brightnesses, and they're all the same brightness, then how far they are is simply their relative brightness. And so this is starting with the concept that we now know is not true, but in 1785 was a good guess to say that all stars have the same brightness and then assume that their distance is based on that. So they assume that all stars were standard candles, which, which we, we know they are not, but still 1785. So they did pretty good. And so that this gave them the first map of the universe, the first one ever made. And so the sun was off to the side. We can see the effect of the edge of the galaxy in that little dip where the nodules are to the, with these two little arms, like an amoeba shape off to the left. And so we have this enormous, enormous shape that would be called, maybe called a grindstone, but the sun's not at the center. There seems to be many, many more stars to the left than there are to the right. And to them, 
This was the map of the universe. Now, there may very well have been things beyond this, but to them, this was it. These were the stars in the sky. So we seem to be one of many in this kind of patch. And then in 1755, which is prior to this, so we're going to bounce around a little bit in time, Immanuel Kant's a philosopher. In 1755, he looked at uh, Thomas Wright's model of a disk and thought, ah, this seems to be about right. And Immanuel Kant said, well, maybe there would, the universe was a lens-shaped disk and was rotating about the center. And the sun was not really any special star in there, and all these other nebulae that were being discovered were rotating Milky Way similar to our own. And what was being discovered was uh, William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross. And in 1845, about 100 years later, built a big telescope in Parsonstown, and he discovered these things called the spiral nebulae. Now, the spiral nebulae looked like disks, but they had some sort of spiral pattern. Some of them looked edge-ons, but with dark bands slicing through the middle, but he could not resolve any of them into stars. I mean, his telescope, while enormous, didn't have the resolution that we think of for high-resolution telescopes today. So this was a big deal, and it, this, the structure I don't believe stands today, but uh, this, this enormous telescope could not be pointed very much to the left or right, but it could certainly be pointed up and down. And using this, he visually recorded the appearance of, star, of galaxies that he called spiral nebulae, or nebulous cloudy objects in the shape of spirals. All right, Kant's idea about a 1755 idea Alexander Humboldt uh, looked at Parsons' spiral nebulae and said, those are other Milky Ways. They're just made of stars. And so they're very, very, very far away. So he thought those disky sort of things have the same appearance as the Milky Way, but just you viewed edge on and far away. So Alexander Humboldt said, the Milky Way is an island universe of lots of stars. And there are many, many, many other galaxies out there. And we're just one of them. However, a very famous mathematician, Pierre Simon Laplace, in 1796, prior to that, we're going to be bouncing around in time, of course, uh, positive that, that, the, that the spiral nebulae that were being seen were, were actually swirling gas clouds that are in the form, process of forming planets and solar systems. So gas clouds should collapse under gravity, and as they collapse, they'll form disks if they have any rotation, and this is what Laplace posited. And the solar system is in a disk-like shape, and there's numerous examples of gaseous sort of phenomena, and these were seen in telescopes and in the, uh, in the Orion Nebula. And so people could actually say, well, if there's a disk-like shape, and so if there's spiral-like structures, then these must be, these must be spiral, uh, spiral formations of new solar systems being found. Now, if they're new solar systems and they're nearby, Maybe the rotation can be discovered. And Laplace's idea said, took more of, more of the Herschel's idea to heart and said, the only things we see in the sky are nearby stars and nearby objects. And so the Milky Way is the universe. And so this is the nebular hypothesis for the spiral, th spiral nebulae. Well, it was not really understood what the heck is which way to go. And until about 1906, Jacobus Captain said, let's actually do something with this. And so he started saying, let's do photographic star counts in many different directions. And so he took Herschel's idea, but then he said, let's photograph stars and measure the apparent magnitude, spectral type, radial velocity, and proper motion of many stars in a bunch of different zones, over 200 zones. And this huge project had lots of different observatories, 40 different locations, and his, under, his process was enormous. It took almost 20 years to complete, uh, approximately 16 years to actually do the whole thing. In 1922, he published his concept of the map of the cosmos, that the universe or the, where, the Milky Way or what have you, the galaxy itself, the sun was not at the center. There were lots of stars. The many of them were very far. The diameter of this disk-like structure was about 17 kiloparsecs, or 17,000 parsecs, or, or 40,000 light years, and about 12,000 light years thick. The thing is, is that his problem was, is that he did not understand what interstellar reddening was, and he vastly underestimated it. In fact, nobody really had a good handle on it at that time. But there were other things that were being discovered. 
And we're looking here at a Kepler Space Telescope view of the globular cluster Messier object number four. And as you can see, the some of the stars seem to be blinking on and off. And this is from Hartman and Stanek of Harvard CF, uh, Center for Astrophysics. And this is using the Kepler mission in its K2 mode as it only has two reaction wheels to help keep it stable, so it can only focus on this area of the sky for a short period of time before it must move on. So one of the objects that Kepler in its K2 mode studied was this globular cluster, and we can see that there are particular kinds of variable stars called RR Lyrae. They literally get brighter and dimmer with time. So these RR Lyrae stars have a particular brightness profile and how they get brighter and dimmer. What's the pattern of brightness and dimness? And they're called RR Lyrae.